a encantadora e hospitaleira capital de Minas Gerais. Boa tarde. É, um, não vou falar em português porque não sei falar português. E não quero inventar a primeira palestra em portuñol. Assim que vou falar em inglês. Um, eu vengo de México. So, 30 years ago, I was born in Mexico City. And as you may know, Mexico is the country where corn, maíz, milo has, was born centuries ago. We call it the land of corn. And actually, corn is very important in our culture, but not just in our culture, but mainly in our gastronomy. And maybe some of you have been going to Mexican restaurants, eating tacos, huh? maybe. Uh, maybe burritos, although burritos are not really Mexicans, sorry. <laughs> but they mostly use uh, what we have here, which are tortillas. These tortillas are made out of corn, and in Mexico, corn consumption is quite big. Uh, as you can see there from the statistics from the FAO, per person per year, a Mexican eats around 120 kilos of corn. So it's not just important in terms of the culture, it's very important in terms, in terms of the nutrition. So by knowing that, when I was 15 years old, I started having dreams. And my dream at that stage was to help creating an enhancement, a nutritious enhancement in corn, so my fellow citizens, Mexicans, that eat a lot of tortillas every day, like bread, will have a better uh, nutrition. Okay, that was my dream when I was 15. And I suppose like people like me when I was 15 and you have a dream like that, the first thing you start to do is to decide to study science, engineering. So that's what I did. So step by step, I, st I start studying biochemical engineering, graduated, and quite fast at the age of 23 I was already working as a research um, associate at the University of Canterbury in the Biological Science Department. I quickly started to uh, participate in projects related to research on biotechnology, which made sense if I come back to this previous, to my previous dream. Oh. Sorry. So, I don't know if you think a lot about inflections in life. Those moments that suddenly change the direction, the current trend of your life, and transforming or deviating into a new one. To me, this happened in 2005. In 2005, I had the opportunity to go to the Solomon Islands. I don't know if many of you know the Solomon Islands. Well, the Solomon Islands it's actually a country, a country that is situated in the Pacific. It's called, it's part of these Pacific Islands. So this is a picture that I took from the plane. This is how it looks like. It is a very interesting place with the highest concentration of ethnicities and languages in the world. And despite of all of that, we don't know it too much. We actually know more about the Solomon Islands because this was the place where lots of the naval battles during the uh, Second World War happened, and lots of divers go, for example, but not many other people. So I went there. I was actually invited by conservation biologists from the Solomons called Patrick Picacha. He brought me to an island that is called Choisol Island, which is in the Solomon Islands, but next to the border with Papua New Guinea. And this is how it looked like. Uh, very beautiful, and it will probably look like uh, some of the places here also in Brazil. So we were there because Patrick was doing a work trying to monitor a native species. In particular, he likes to study frogs. So I don't know why, but uh, scientists like him, biologists, 
like to work at night, maybe because frogs, I don't know, maybe they usually go out at night, like some people here also in Brazil and Latin America. Well, just like frogs, we had to go outside at night with Patrick, and we were looking for these frogs, and it just, after 30 seconds of getting out of the field station, I realized that this was not my environment completely. I was completely blind. Imagine this dark, to me, it was, I was completely like a blind man. I, I already wear glasses, imagine me in here. Because I'm very used to cities, for example, not, but not really to this kind of environment. It was uh, even more interesting, my experience, when I started to see that Patrick was using his lantern and already uh, starting to spot some of the different frogs. For me, it was completely invisible. But the most interesting thing here, here is that the boy, the teenager that was leading this expedition, he was actually spotting the place where organisms were going to appear even before the expert, even before Patrick. And at that moment, I start to realize that something interesting was happening. And I start to look on how this non-expert, this teenager, had a different sight definitely compared to mine, but also different from the real expert, from Patrick. But the Solomon Islands do not only have a forest, they also have cities. And in the city of Honiara, which is the capital, we um, and some colleagues from the University of Canterbury, like Professor uh, Jack Heinemann, uh, my friend and colleague from the Solomon Islands, Paul Roham, start to organize some capacity building initiatives to discuss biotechnology in the Som Solomon Islands and discuss biology in general. The person you see here is Nanette Tutua. She's a businesswoman from the Solomon Islands. What she's having there is a DNA extraction from a papaya. She was able to visualize DNA. So how this happened? Because Solomon Islands is one, or it's considered one of the least developed places in the world. So there are no real laboratories for molecular biology in there. But what we had to do is to improvise, to do uh, different kind of experiments in order to extract DNA and to so her so uh, Nadette could see how DNA looked like and by looking at this she was able to demystify DNA and DNA was not just something that is abstract and she cannot understand this time she was able to see it understand it and when someone wanted to talk about biotechnology she had somehow some confidence to talk about it. She seems quite proud of doing her extraction. And actually, DNA extractions, I don't know if you know, but are quite easy to do. You just need salt, detergent, and alcohol. So I start to use these three ingredients, put it into my bag, and start to travel around, doing exactly what we did in the Salomons, repeating the experience, bringing the demystification of DNA. This happened in different places of the world, but uh, definitely my most important experience was when last November, a DNA extraction was featured in a Chilean soap opera called Decibel 110. <laughs> a low-cost kitchen DNA extraction was part of this meetup uh, between Francisco and her prohibited love, Cindy. We didn't stop at a DNA extraction. We suddenly start to play also with instruments of molecular biology. Here you have some pictures of uh, workshops we perform in the Philippines, where we actually start to develop some basic molecular lab equipment. As you can see there, it looks quite basic, but it's actually some of the equipment that is mostly used in uh, laboratories. So, once I started to build up this kind of motion and instruments, and trying to work out with this low-cost technology and the demystification, and with all those travels, I suddenly found myself in West Africa. And West Africa was also an inflection point for me. The reason for that is that in West Africa, I found for the first time a hub of people that were thinking a bit like me, that were asking questions that were asking questions about the experts, that were asking questions about technology, 
what kind of technology for whom. They were asking questions about what Africa can bring to the world. The interesting thing here is that they were mainly social scientists, but also farmers and, scient and artists talking about this. So we decide to stay more. And I've been going to West Africa every year since 2007. And the basic question of it, it's based on this picture. As you can see, we have a plane. A plane represents technology. I think, as, you can, uh, as we can agree, uh, planes have changed the way we move, the way we communicate, but also the way diseases are transmitted and also pests. But what is important in here is not just to look at the technology, but to look at the context surrounding it. And maybe for some of you, this will look quite nice. For me, it allows me to make the questions about what is the context about? What this technology can offer to the context? Does this technology fit into the context? And those, that question was used and based for our documentary. <laughs> C'est la science qui dit, c'est pas l'évangile. Ce sont les hommes qui font la science. La science doit être faite par les hommes, pour les hommes. Pourquoi on fait la recherche Qui fait la recherche Pour quelle finalité Et les spécialistes se réfugient dans leur bureau, dans leur sec, pour décider pour tout le monde. Faire une politique agricole. En absence des agriculteurs, ça veut dire qu'on ne parle pas de l'agriculture. Le paysan il doit se considérer comme chercheur, comme celui qui se trouve en laboratoire. Il ne suffit pas d'être dans un laboratoire pour faire de la recherche. Aujourd'hui, on extrait de l'ADN des plantes. Il ne suffit pas d'être dans une institution pour faire de la recherche. C'est le matériel qu'on va utiliser, du sel, du détergent liquide. On a de l'alcool et des pipettes en verre. La pièce de l'ADN, on a vu ça. Moi, j'ai vu l'ADN, les amis ont vu l'ADN. Et pas dans ça le microscope optique, non moins alors l'électronique. Il faut désinstitutionnaliser la recherche. So this is just a fragment of the documentary Autrement that we did uh, in West Africa. And as you can see, it just raises questions about technology, science, but based on the context in West Africa. And as you can see, there is an empowerment of it. There is a message that Africans want to say about what they can offer. So after building kind of a boat with instruments and methods, starting to use them in different parts of the globe, then I decide also to observe. And this comes from a so-called expert that is no, now want to talk about the non-experts. Usually, the non-experts uh, are kind of invisible in this generation of knowledge. Mostly, uh, non-experts are consumers or users of knowledge, of technology, of science. We have had several technological revolutions, starting with uh, information technology, starting also in agriculture, lots of technical revolutions. But most of the people in the world, and I'm talking here also about countries, have been mostly consumers and users. This is a list of the technologies that uh, Diamandis, which Peter Diamandis from uh, Singularity University proposed at the last TED, TED talk. This list, which is quite interesting, he proposed are the technologies that will change and they are already changing the future. And among these technologies, he also talked about the crowd and the power of the crowd. He actually introduced the term cyber citizens which are normal citizens, people like us, that participate via online. And in his example, it was in a game of folding proteins. Not only for the pleasure of playing a game, but actually to solve medical problems. And this is where our, we are now, in a world where the non-expert are not just consumers and users, but they are transforming themselves into, into contributors. We heard today, this morning, a very good example of it happening here in the Amazon. But some of these are also what we call the CrowdX, or crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, 
A very good example is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a contribution of the non-experts. And we have lots of examples like that. The citizen science, the biohackers. This is happening right now. The who is changing. The non-experts are contributing right now. However, I'm here to propose something more radical than just being contributors. I want also to raise questions regarding the what. What kind of technology? Is that the only list of technologies that will shape the future? I don't think so. I don't think there is only one way to see how we are going to develop ourselves into the future. I actually think that we need more, and we have more. We need knowledge that starts to develop from the context, context-based. We hear some examples from West Africa and the Solomons. Those are different contexts, and they can develop new ways to see generation of knowledge. We have probably, we probably need to unlabel, to do not say science is just this, and if you start to bring some art into this, then it's not science, you can talk about that. Maybe we have to start unlabeling things. For example, in, in our documentary, we talk about science and development, but we use contemporary African dance to talk about that. Why? Because if you talk about contemporary dance in Africa, things make sense. If you don't use the culture in it, things do not make sense. It is important to work out in the demystification, in the democratization, decentralization. I think we can have very good examples for research coming from these places. Solomon Islands, this tiny archipelago, could become, for example, the best observatory monitoring of global changes in the world. And this could be the new research centers happening around the world. Maybe these are the new contributors. I actually believe that we have passed from technological revolution to right now in a crowd revolution, but we need something else. We need a humble revolution. We need humbleness. We need to reduce our ego, our ego, those who, are, who consider themselves specialists or experts, we need to reduce the ego. Once we, once we reduce the ego, we are able to identify the potential among our peers, among, among those that we call the non-experts. And by doing that, we will be able to start new directions, new, new directions for science, for technology, or you, you can call it the way you want. I will just finish with this slide which to me represents empowerment. Because I'm here, standing in front of you. And that dream that I had when I was 15 years old, I want you to remember, that dream has changed. That dream has actually expanded. I don't want to build with a bunch of experts a technological tool to help the population of my country. I want to create something new. I want to expand my horizon. And this is all. Thank you very much.